you. <laughs> but the, the motorbike driver died, and the car driver was fine. Wow. And I was just like, you can't get a motorbike, yeah. blah, 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 risk, and da, 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 da. And he was like, yeah, but, you know, Mr. Nabs, um, I could die. And we were on the way to the shooting range. Okay. <laughs> Here's where the <laughs> so, story gets funny. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, welcome to another episode. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Today, I have a truly inspirational guest, um, Nabil Al Busaidi. Al Busaidi, yeah. How, how was that for an English yeah. Arab uh, pronunciation? Well, this is your second attempt. Yeah, so. right. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, dude, um, it's an absolute pleasure, and we're humbled to have you on the show and for you to take out the time and come here. Um, ever since I was young, I always had the idea and the and the you know the dreams to do the kind of things that you actually did not like me who was going yeah that's a cool dream and then just carried on doing playing football yeah. <laughs> or doing whatever you know um you've done a lot of things which are like a lot of kids kind of set their sights on those kind of things and not just a lot of kids a lot of adults yeah and a lot of them are not easy so let's explain to everyone you know give them a, a, a brief uh, i'd say history um about you and what you do where you're from and everything just so they can get a kind of idea and then we'll get into the expeditions yeah and stuff after okay. that yeah so i mean obviously the the main reason that people get me on their shows to talk about crazy stuff is because i was the first arab to walk to the magnetic north pole so 650 kilometers to the magnetic north pole and i'm the first arab to pardon me it's all right it's the red bull <laughs> we've been giving him red bull for the last hour here <laughs> i'm yeah. hyper yeah. um and the second thing is that I was the first Arab to row across the Atlantic. So wow. from Africa to the Caribbean, so 4,600 kilometers. So those two expeditions were not only the, the fact that I was the first Arab, but um, only 400 people have walked to a pole and only 500 people have rowed an ocean. Wow. And only and made six, it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Have made it alive. Yeah. And only 600, uh, sorry, six in the world have ever done a pole and an ocean. Wow. And five of them are English and, and then there's and me. Then this is you. This is <laughs> yeah. the one her is like, hello. <laughs> See, that's a thing because you kind of breaking barriers because you put the words Arab yeah. and walking in the same sentence <laughs> where we're known to be lazy. So so to, to know, I mean, there's a reason why you're the, the first <laughs> that's, Arab to, that's to do the it. Reason. And a lot of it is to do with we're just too lazy to do anything because we have that oh, famous God. word. Inshallah, <laughs> which means, yeah, maybe not, maybe tomorrow. Let's just pretend we're going to do it now. Actually, so I used to start my, um, I used to start a lot of my uh, presentations by saying, you know, it, it sounds grandiose saying, oh, I did this, I did this. And I say, you know, I did this, did this and this. Or as my friends like to say, I'm the first Arab to walk further than the car park to the shopping exactly, mall. Right? Exactly. Uh, I had to stop because somebody said I was being racist. <laughs> no, look, at the end of the day, we both know. You did the North Pole because it's the closest to AC you can get. Now, if we told you to walk the desert, if we told you to yeah. walk from one side to the other side of the desert, not, you not would have been like, Lala, inshallah, no, no, inshallah, no. inshallah. People treat, keep trying to get me camping. And exactly. I'm like, it's too hot. Oh, I love camping. It's bloody amazing. <laughs> so where did you... Okay, so you guys are original, originally our money. And yes. I'm going to start charging your family now yeah. um, because I've had your brother, I've had you, and I'm getting your sister on as well. So it's like, I think I need a bit of, uh, a bit of commission. commission. Yeah, coming, okay. coming this way. Um, what took you guys to England in the first place? Uh, well, so my parents were born in Zanzibar. Um, it's my favorite place on earth. And uh, I, you know, long story, but they were and they ended up in London. They met in London, got married there. They were living there. That, and so my sister, in fact, my brother who you met, my yeah. sister and myself were all born in London. Wow. Yeah. So that's, you know. Uh, and then, uh, you know, the Sultan in Oman, the, new, the, the Sultan that unfortunately died recently, he took over in Oman and... Uh, eventually Omani started going back to Oman and so uh, we ended up um, the family ended up moving from England to uh, Oman. Wow so was this a thing that as a kid you kind of had that will and that drive and those aspirations or was it something that happened later in life? I, I don't know um, it's a very good question and I've, I've been so recently an uncle who who was my guardian at boarding school in London yeah. died and I've been looking all the old letters and uh, even like my old um, uh, school reports. Yeah, yeah. And one of the, one of the, I even took a photo of it because it was so funny. One year, one of the, uh, the, the PE teacher wrote, um, this guy has nothing going for him physically, right? Because... <laughs> 
I was I was shorter, smaller, weaker, yeah. slower than everyone in the class. Yeah. Anyway, the year after, we had a different uh, teacher, uh, PE teacher, and uh, this guy said, this guy is an inspiration for everyone because he never gives up. He always gives his best. He's always smiling. He's all, And I was like, yeah. you know. That's how you got to look at things to, to your dick teacher, the first one. It's like, you're not looking at the, the, the you know. Exactly. Yeah. And I was thinking, God, how much, uh, looking at all the reports from year one to year seven, I was looking, the teacher's reports and my feelings about the teacher made a lot of difference about how I felt about that subject. Mm. But this particular one was brilliant because it was, it wasn't, it wasn't, it was year three and year four, yeah, yeah. you know, same subject. Yeah, so yeah. I'm, I'm a complete waste of time yeah. and I'm an inspiration, you yeah. know. It's just how you look at it and it's also how the teachers treat you anyway. So I'm not sure when this sort of uh, desire never to give up came, but mm. I, I'm sure that a lot of it is um, slowly percolated over the years because in my year I was always the shortest. Mm. So I'm having to play rugby against bigger guys. Mm. So I'm having to prove myself you know not mm -hmm. i can't just be as good i have to prove myself to be better than them yeah. just to get the same respect so um yeah so then in the end i'm sure that makes a big difference because then you know uh challenges mm -hmm. all these kind of things i'm i'm totally up for challenges right and then you know i ended up uh i ended up in the british army and then how, how did that happen um, and were your parents up for it because it's like i'm going to the british army like excuse me <laughs> You're going where, my friend? No, no, no. You're going back to Oman, my friend. You're not going to fight for this. Uh, my, ma my mother thought it was a great... I think, yeah, I think my mother thought it was a great idea because she said, you know, they'll give you some discipline. You won't yeah, leave yeah. your room in a mess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, that's not yeah, why... Yeah, like, yeah. That's they'll not how also the get me killed, mom. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, and my father... I don't think my father was particularly keen either, but anyway. I, how I was that experience for you? I don't want to interrupt you, but... Because we know that, obviously, racism I think, is a thing that happens. And... How many years ago was that when you joined the army now? Um, oh, it was a long time ago, but... The w was it a thing then, back then? Because, you know, you have you have stages where they've gotten better and stuff like that. But when, did, was it even more difficult joining the army as this a black is person? a big discussion, and I'll tell you right now. In any society, in any environment, any group, they're always going to be racist. They're going to be people with um, prejudices. But... You talk about the military systemically. Are they uh, are they racist? I wouldn't say they are. What I would say mm. is they're very discriminatory. And mm. what I mean by discriminatory is, if you're not good enough, they'll discriminate. Yeah, yeah. And they don't give a damn if yeah. you're black, female, ginger, mm. short, wearing glasses. Yeah. You do your job. You're good Fine. enough. Yeah. Yeah. So the racism that I found in the military were two types. There was one who were just the guys who were just card-carrying members of the KKK yeah, yeah, yeah. and, yeah, yeah. you know, it had nothing to do with the British military. Second type were uh, the guys that were like, um, oh, this guy's always late. This guy's always messing up. This guy... And yeah. then it would be the fucking... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm yeah. allowed to... <laughs> you can say whatever you want, Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then they say, you know, effing... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, effing you know, and then it would be racist comments, but not because of the race, but because of his... Uh, <sighs> his inability to do his job yeah yeah so um that's very interesting because i mean even growing up i grew up i mean i'm going to be 40 next year so growing up in the 80s 90s it was very weird because you, you were kind of from both worlds you were an arab mm. when you were in england yeah yeah but you were a English. An English person when you were back home. Yeah, yeah, but at the same time, you had all of your other friends who kind of also saw you as English as well because they grew up with you. So it was the older generation and, and the friends that had two completely different ways of viewing you. And it was yeah. just like, you, where do I belong? Actually, I don't think racism was as big an issue when I was in the military as homosexuality because mm. at that time there was this sort of, uh, it was this watershed between the older generation were always, so when I started basic training, they'd always say, you faggot, you mm. girls blouse, you know, they'd mm. say homophobic things to mm. insult you. Yeah. But the guys that were coming through basic training had grown up at school with yeah, openly yeah. gay people. Yeah, so yeah. they actually had no problem with it. So yeah, yeah. as those guys uh, entered the military and became more senior, that's when the, 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 the switch from no homosexuals in the military to 
whatever. Yeah, who cares? Yeah. Uh, because it's a reflection of society. It's yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Look, at the end of the day, if somebody's watching my back, I don't care what color they are. I don't care what they do. Yeah. Just make sure your gun is pointed over my shoulder yeah. and you're protecting yeah, me. Yeah, exactly. And, and make sure you don't get distracted and look at my ass while I was like, I want you to straight look there. <laughs> Kill him and then you can look at my ass after. Just make sure so I'm safe. Save my ass. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> save it before you yeah, look at it. Yeah, exactly. And 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 at the same time, there was this big, uh, big debate in 97 when Labour took over in 97. When the government took over, it was the two big debates at the time were women in combat and mm -hmm. gays serving openly. Yeah. And both of them were kind of, they almost became non-issues because within the military at the time, it was just like, well... Yeah, yeah, who cares? Yeah, exactly. Obviously, the older generation... Yeah, yeah of course, like, they, oh. they always will. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But, but so how, how much did the military, how far was it from first expedition in the military and how much did the military prepare you for those kind of things mentally and physically yeah so a lot of people ask for example uh, how did you train for the expeditions mm. and I, I i i didn't actually do any much specific training because um the one thing that i couldn't cope with was the cold okay so pardon me <clears throat> that red bull's making me yeah, that's, that's fine. <laughs> the, so the cold is actually uh, the thing that i struggled most with um but the walking every day, 30 kilometers, walking, dragging 50 k kilos of equipment behind me. Um, actually, that'd be a good point to put a picture of, yeah, of, yeah, yeah. of what we'll I did sure, yeah. Yeah, into the video. So <clears throat> the all that sort of dragging equipment and walking and everything, I've been doing that all my life, you know? So mm. it wasn't, a, it wasn't a, I didn't specifically train for that, but over, you know, 10, 15 years... I had you been carrying getting, backpacks and yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So um, even you know, dragging the fifty k's wasn't the problem. All the, the my all, all my problems came from the cold, and of course, yeah, that was exacerbated by the fact that I lived at the time I was living in Bahrain. So okay. when I I was living in plus forty, yeah, and then I went to minus forty. Wow! So if it's you can imagine, completely different opposite polar opposites, right? When you when you when you go, let's say you go from Dubai to uh, the UK, and it's it's 40 here and you go to and it's in, in england it's 20 and you're yeah. like it's cold yeah yeah imagine that's 20 degree drop imagine yeah. 80 degree drop wow okay why though what what made you go was that was that your first expedition yeah and well that's a good question why yeah. um and and i, I want to know exactly the story of first when the thought came into your head because obviously that thought i don't think was the actual thought as in the yeah, yeah i'm yeah. gonna do it there was a uh, I'm going to do that. And uh, then you're like, no, actually, I am going to do that. Someone, someone's briefed you. No, no one, honestly. <laughs> um, Just a very smart guy. <laughs> because I've had all those thoughts up to the part of doing it. <laughs> well, uh, so was, yeah. uh, were we talking about this earlier? Why do so many people have this thought, right? Yeah. I'd like to climb Everest, yeah. for example. So many people think, oh, it'd be cool to climb Everest, right? So why not do it? You know, stop thinking about it. Yeah. Why don't you do it, right? So that's me. I get an idea and I was like, oh, yeah, that'd be cool, that'd be cool. Well, stop saying it and do it, yeah. right? So I had this idea, um, <laughs> it started really bad, started really weird. I was at, I went to lunch, I was in Bahrain working, went for lunch, sat near a guy who was a, a quite, not a famous, but he was well-known roadrunner. Okay. And I said, hey, you know, I can't remember his name, blah, blah, blah. And then, um, yeah, I'm thinking about going to Everest. I was like, oh, that's cool. And he said, do you want to come with me? I was like, what? Like, uh, no, I'm just here for lunch. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know you. That's a pretty weird, <laughs> deep question to ask someone you just met. Yeah. Uh, but two weeks later, it, it was in my head for two weeks, the whole time, germinating that idea. And the whole time I was like, you've always thought, wouldn't it be cool to climb Everest? And this guy is talking about it. Why don't you do it? Wow. So I, I, I called him up and I said, you know, long conversation, but... Well, long story, but eventually what happened was um, I knew a guy from the army and he'd done a lot of expeditions, mm. major expeditions. So I called, uh, got, got in touch with him and I said, you know, I'm thinking about doing Everest. What do you think? You know, I, I have no idea what I'm doing. I don't even know what I'm talking about, but I like, I like the idea and I want to do it. And he said, yeah, it's cool if you want to do Everest. I mean, 4,000 people have climbed Everest. It's, you know, it's not a particularly difficult uh, expedition, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, if you do it, you won't be the first Arab. You won't be the first, you know, blah, blah, blah. But why don't you go to the North Pole? If you go to the North Pole, 
only let's say 400 people have done it mm. a lot more unique and you'll be the first arab now with any record that you can hold if you're the oldest person to climb everest mm. yeah some next year somebody older will climb yeah, yeah. you're the youngest somebody younger will do if you're the fastest uh, strongest highest whatever record you have somebody will always come and break your record yeah but if you're the first then nobody will ever be able to nobody run. will ever okay i'm sold yeah <laughs> i'll do it then i'm going to do it I, so i completely pivoted from uh, everest to north pole uh, it turned out i was going to the magnetic north pole but whatever uh 650 kilo so why why I emphasize 650 kilo, uh, kilometers is because um there are a lot of people who will fly most of the way and then walk the rest 89 degrees north and they'll walk the last degree so yeah. it's called the last degree but it's like a um i mean they call it a holiday adventure so it's and it, it takes like th three five days you know you fly there in a helicopter and you do the, the so it's like saying uh, yeah. you know did you run a marathon well yeah i i, I it's 42 kilometers i drove 40 kilometers yeah, and i ran the last yeah, yeah. two but yeah i did the marathon it's like yeah. well no you, you do, didn't that yeah. doesn't really count does it okay so that's why i emphasize 650 kilometers we started off from resolute bay which is the most northerly town in the world or yeah city village whatever it's the most northerly town in the world uh started from there and walked all the way up to the magnetic north pole how long did that take so that took five weeks five weeks of walking and how how let's talk through a day so you'd wake up at what time uh interesting question because there is no time. You don't know what time it is, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. see, think about it. When you you have, we're in times of GMT plus four here, right? Okay. Um, as you get north, as you get north, more and more closer to the north, the time zones all converge, right? Wow. So you could, you could, I mean, theoretically, you could take three steps to the right and go, you know, I'm in New York time, and then five steps to the left, and yeah. you're in Thailand time, right? obviously that's right near the top yeah. so um and also uh, at that time of year it's 24 hour sunlight yeah yeah right so <laughs> but um we 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 kept our uh, all our timings on um canadian time okay uh 8 a.m we would wake up it would take two hours to break tent uh so break okay, tent doesn't up. mean break it but yeah. take a, you know cook yeah. breakfast eat breakfast break the tent put everything store everything get ready to go so it would take about two hours to do everything in the morning um bearing in mind it's minus 40. so everything you do outside you've got to do with gloves you've got these big thick you mm. know gloves um and you have to do quick uh can i use can i use the prop yeah go for it for sure <laughs> it actually it's, has movable fingers as well so you can uh, so yeah. imagine you're trying to you know i'm trying to do my shoelaces with this big thing right yeah yeah, yeah. um so you're doing everything with thick gloves outdoors yeah so everything just takes longer and sometimes mm. you need you know you need your your teammate to help you do stuff that you just but at minus 40 i'm sure you have like a, a limit of 15 i think 15 minutes before frostbite just like if you take your glove off no 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 well no um i mean at minus 80 ish the you know if you the fluid on your eyeballs will freeze up yeah so there was one you know you you, you know if you don't have your goggles on you start you know wow. in minus 80. the fluid on your eyelids uh, on your eyeball freezes every time you're blinking you're breaking ice on your eyeball right wow at um there was one point uh so a lot of this was filmed uh they wanted to film me praying so at one point i got out in the tent and i tried to do salah in the near the yeah. north pole right wasn't your compass just swinging around like yeah that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah oh yeah you absolutely just, you used to be like yeah. yeah good point see so where where's kibla yeah it doesn't matter uh i mean i i tried to find this stuff yeah. out it was kibla it like doesn't a, matter because yeah. <laughs> just go rotating around <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. and also what time is 24 hour sunlight yeah. what? when's maghrib yeah, yeah. when's yeah. maghrib yeah. i'd hate to be f doing ramadan yeah, yeah exactly right so, um Anyway, I did one prayer um, in the North Pole, and it wasn't it wasn't minus eighty; it was around minus thirty. Uh, and then, of course, you're standing there like this, and then you want to bend, and you're like, "Oh my God! All the fluid in my joints has frozen." Gone, yeah. So I'm like, "Okay." 
Yeah, because all the synovial fluid around your exactly. around your bones yeah. just oh wow. Yeah. So then you you watch the video, and it looks like I'm an old man because I'm getting yeah. oh, I'm trying to bend over. Um, yeah, so it's kind of funny because that's uh, I'll send you the uh, the clip, but um, when actually it might be good to insert yeah, yeah, it uh, yeah. when you see it. You it's at the end of the um, so there's like a there's a, a trailer for the documentary. And in the trailer, I show that trailer when I go to see, uh, you know, I go to schools, I mm. talk to the kids and I'll show this trailer so that they can understand. Before I talk, they see the video so they understand like what's snow, yeah, what's a sled, a visual, what's yeah. a, yeah. And then they see me praying and that's one of the last visuals before the end of the documentary. And everyone goes, yeah! Mm. And like every wow. time I see it, I'm like, that was the worst yeah. lot ever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was the la first and last time I yeah. prayed up at the... Uh, it's like, you know, when they say... Like you're growing up, your parents say, "Oh, if you do this one, do you know how many rakas is worth?" You'd be like, "I wonder how many rakas this one was worth." <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I'm sure this is eighty or something. Yeah. Right? Please God, don't let yeah, me yeah, die of exactly. cold. Please yeah. don't let me die of cold. Please. Don't let and how was that as a, as an experience? So, I mean, did you? How many of you were there that went? So in our team, uh, there was three of us. Um, and you made sure when you were in the team, you were like. Yep, yep, yep. No, 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 Arabs. You go. I am the first Arab who's going up here. No, Mohammed, you're not coming. <laughs> Bring Steve. Steve. Okay, good. good. Good white team here I've got with me. <laughs> I don't think that's ever going to be a problem yeah. too much. Um, so out of, out of, uh, I think out of the, I can't remember the numbers now, but 50% of the people that have been to Poll are English. 25% mm. uh, are Scandinavian, Norwegian mainly. They just got lost and are going for a walk. And, uh, well, it's just, you know, it's, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's it's normal for them. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the last 25% is a mixture of Russians and Americans. And then there's the odd one or two mm. people from, let's say, random countries like Korea, Japan yeah, or, yeah. Or, or Omar, yeah, yeah, right? Exactly. So, um, uh, yeah. So it's, it's, and in the same thing with, um, uh, same thing with Everest. Mm -hmm. It's roughly, roughly the same thing. It's about so many Brits, uh, mm. about 30, 40% Brits. And then, you know, Nepalese, mm -hmm. and then you look at all the nationalities, but then when you get down to the last, let's say 25%, it's odd, odds and ends. Yeah. But the uh, Nepalese are the Sherpas, they're there anyway, right? They're making money there. Actually, lots of Lebanese have done it. Yeah, Maxim Cheya, I don't know if you know him. No, I'm talking about the Nepalese. Oh, the, yeah, the Nepalese. The, the, yeah. They would have a lot more if they weren't Sherpas. So when you're when you're climbing Everest, what normally happens is they they there are lots of them, and and there's a hierarchy so you've got the porters who yeah, just yeah. carry yeah. stuff to base camp then you have um uh you have rope layers and uh so there's guys that go up the mountain mm -hmm. these guys let's say every season they'll be going up nice. laying rope yeah. like putting in ice um ice uh, anchors and and inserting rope and, and laying it all the way up so that when you got when you come you use the rope to guide yourself up so they'll be going up to camp one back down up to camp two back down up to camp three back down up to camp yeah. four back down up to 200 meters from the summit laying rope yeah. and back down and so these guys will do i don't know maybe five ten seasons of laying rope and they'll have climbed the equivalent of everest yeah, yeah. every season they'll have climbed it three four times wow but never actually summited wow and Are they then, allowed to? Well, then they become uh, guides. Okay. And so they get promoted from, uh, and then they, so once they've had a few seasons of actually lowering the top rope, mm. they then can become a guide if they've got good English or they speak a language that uh, um, a client mm. needs. And then they get to, you know, so um, my, our head ship on our, on our, on my expedition had done it 22 times. Wow. That's how many times he summited. How many times he he done the equivalent yeah, of? Yeah, the rope. Maybe a hundred times. Because wow. did you find it hard, Everest? I mean, be honest. No, not particularly. Really? Yeah. I mean, you see, I, and, and look, you let me, hear that people you, they walk past dead people on the way. They're just like, there's just a guy there who's just so, like, yeah, like that, and it's just like, <laughs> okay. So let me qualify that because if that's taken out of context, I, I everyone's going to jump on me. Mm. Um, so I didn't summit Everest, okay? Okay. Uh, that's A, so of course, you know, who the hell am I to talk about it? But um, the the reason why I said I... So... The, the, okay, let's try it this way. Mathematically, every single day when you're climbing on Everest, mm -hmm. you do maybe four hours or five, six hours of climbing, right? And 
it's hard work it's very thin oxygen so it's, it's actually it's really tough so when i said i didn't find it mm. i meant i didn't find it hard in comparison yeah, to yeah, too. yeah so would you would you rather do let's say six hours of climbing everest or 10 hours of walking at the north pole pulling uh 50 kilos parking on the first floor of mall of emirates would be <laughs> and the last yeah. one is rowing for 12 yeah, hours we're, a day we're gonna, we're gonna, yeah we're gonna get into that and but when i talk about you rowing do, you look, when you go to the gym i mean I, this is it, it's very difficult to uh because this is so out of the realm of most people so yeah. if you ever go to the gym have you ever used a rowing yeah, machine of course but it's nowhere near the same as actually rowing the answer the water. is yes i have yeah. and i did it for five minutes and it was too bloody difficult and yeah. then i gave up after five minutes so the most i've ever mm. done on a rowing machine was half an hour yeah and after i'm buggered now imagine you did that for two hours mm. and then uh, at the end of the two hours you would go at the end of two hours in the gym you go home you have a shower you eat you food eat, yeah. you go to sleep in a bed and da 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 no i want you to sleep in the same clothes yeah smelly smelly clothes and i want you to jam yourself in with four other guys like sardines yeah. because the boat is doing this the whole time the rowing yeah. boat is doing this the whole time so if you're sleeping on your own you're rolling around but the boat was it had a cap on it as well right it wasn't like a yeah but a normal yeah okay open, open robot right yeah so yeah i guess we need to show a, yeah. a, 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 maybe even a video clip yeah. but the point is once you're claustrophobic to be honest yeah yeah once you're inside yeah. that cabin wherever you sleep it doesn't matter because the yeah, boat is yeah. rocking yeah and if you don't wedge yourself in to the other sweaty guys you're constantly rolling over as the boat rolls so you won't get, get any sleep so i want you to do forget about going home having a shower and everything and eating you're gonna go lie on the on this hard deck yeah crammed in with these other guys you're gonna sleep for 90 minutes and you're gonna get up and you're gonna do another two hours of rowing mm. and then do it again you're gonna do it again, do it again. how and long again. did that take the atlantic and again and again and you're doing it 24 hours a day two hours on two hours off two hours on two hours off every mm. single day for 43 days that's how long you guys were out there for yeah do you not did you not have a sense of fear that hey i'm going into the middle of nowhere like if anything goes wrong i mean did you guys have um people who were supporting you on, no, the, on the way unsupported so you guys unsupported. went and that was it like you make it you make it you don't anything you, goes wrong that's it you got to figure it out yourselves <laughs> yes did you have kind of like and when you say it like that i yeah. just think how stupid i was right, right? <laughs> because um there was no safety net well i mean there were safety that's precautions what I, that's what i was gonna ask no did you have net? like uh these apollo 13 moments where you had to be like all right give me that bit and then we'll try and figure out how to yes we did and it, yeah we had loads of those i mean on the but this is the problem with the, and this, this is what one of the reasons why n so few people have done the expeditions that i've done is mm. it is beyond difficult Hmm. so normally when you rate uh, when uh, somebody rates an expedition i don't know how this will look on the camera but uh you'll have the one axis and it'll say one two three four yeah. five and it'll say how physically difficult is it one is like kilimanjaro two is i don't know mont blanc three is you know four is everest five is you know k2 five star is hmm. rowing the atlantic five star is walking to uh, a pole hmm. And then you have A to E, as in technical difficulty. A is like uh, Kilimanjaro again, because you don't, yeah, you just walk it. it. Yeah, yeah. It's, there's no ropes or climbing or, you know, you have to be trained. You just mm. walk up, you walk down. And then you go to E, which is like the most technically difficult thing in, mm. you know. Um, and, that, and I guess that's a, a, another metric where you can say comparatively Everest wasn't the hardest thing mm. I've done. Now, again, I'm, I'm only saying this. If they said do Everest and relay your own ropes, then yeah, that would have absolutely. been... Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because it's now so commercialized. Yeah. Uh, it's completely different from from uh, when... I uh, forget what his name was, but when they tried to do it in 1922. Yeah. Um, or even Edmund Hillary. Mm. Because they were breaking snow. So the one of the worst things is, can you imagine being in snow this high yeah. and you're having to tramp the snow forward? You're, yeah, yeah. You know, you're, you're doing this. 
and you're with tramping your old, with your old tennis racket snowshoes <laughs> exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. right so yeah. then that's difficult yeah. and, and also I mean let's be fair the first guys who rode the Atlantic in the 60s the first pair that did mm. it the Allen brothers they did it in an old wooden rowing boat yeah they did it without GPS they did it without solar panels they did it without a water maker we had like a so did they literally just read the stars and just go yeah they even so one I was I mean we all had to do our ocean masters yeah uh, certificate but I was the navigator because I was one of the best at you know sextant and yeah, yeah. taking the sun reading and doing all that kind of yeah. stuff and mapping the stars yeah they they were telling before we went off we met these guy one of the guys and he was saying yeah when at midday I would stand on the boat between the two wooden and, the uh, shadow. and then I would try and take the yeah. uh, you know and the boat is doing this and he's trying to take a, uh, and I was like I was I said to this guy I said I cannot imagine doing what you did. Yeah. Because it's it seems infinitely harder than what we're doing. We're doing it in a you know in a a, a, a fiber boat with yeah, a, yeah. you know all this stuff and and he was like, like you got, we got sponsors on the side of our boat like sponsors, yeah, 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 yeah. right. We had yeah. sat phones and we yeah, had yeah. you know emergency radio beacons and all this kind yeah. of stuff and he was like and uh, to his credit hmm. I think he was being very generous to me. He just said but at the end of the day, you still have to row all the way there yeah. across the Atlantic, and that's no harder or easier than what I had to do. Which I Here, yeah. here's an interesting question. Now, if us three are in a car and we're driving for too far, I get annoyed with them. I can't deal with it. After about two hours of driving, I'm just like, I want to kill these guys. <laughs> okay. Now, how much in a situation uh, like that, 45 days, what does that do to your mental health and to the group? I mean, surely you, you guys, there must have been times where you wanted to kill each other. Kill each other, absolutely. And 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 actually, really, and also, did you get any kind of hallucinations and, and those kind of things where... Yeah, two-part question. Okay, yeah. first bit. Um, I so Tell me the juicy stories. I know you got stories. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. So there's a guy called Serrano Fines. Okay. Uh, and he's a major... He, I think Guinness Book of Records calls him the greatest living adventurer or explorer, right? So I've got a lot of his books, read a lot of his books, a bit of a hero of mine. Um, and I was reading in one of his books that when he was trying to walk to the South Pole with his best friend, uh, Dr. Mike Stroud, they were walking along and of course they put up camp and etc. And um, I can't remember which way it was, but one of them was eating an apple. Eating the apple and then like a normal, well, I'd say like a normal human being, he leaves the, the core, the xylem, the stem, yeah, yeah, the yeah. you know, he leaves that bit. And uh, the other one was like, you're wasting food. And he's like, well, you know, I've eaten most of the flesh on this apple. And the two of them get into the most heated argument over nothing. I mean, that's the point. Yeah. They get into this heated argument over nothing. They spend three days where they don't talk to each other. He plots how to kill his best friend and dispose of the body and then come up with an excuse of you know oh uh, yeah. yeah mike he, he fell down a crevice or you know whatever yeah. right so he writes about this in his book i mean i've, I've probably paraphrased it and gotten mm. you know butchered the story but the point is they had an argument over nothing they ended up um he ended up plotting to kill his best friend anyway after about three days uh they, they built the tent and you know they're sitting there and uh he relents he's finally he just you know what, i'm really sorry i've been we had this bitter argument bitter argument about nothing and I've just come to my senses and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And um, I've been plotting to kill you. And and um, and Mike says, yeah, I've been doing the same. No right? way. And I was like, oh, God. Okay, so I've read this book and I've taken on board this lesson. It's a bit like uh, Lord of the Flies. You yeah. know, it's a bit, uh, yeah. you know, they, they get a bit, I don't know if you know Lord of the Flies. Yeah, yeah, kill the pig, hunt yeah, him yeah. down, right? So I was like, okay, right. Got to remember this story, right? So <clears throat> there was a point in our, um, there was a point in our, in our uh, in the North Pole, and uh, so I've still got the story. I mean, it's in the back of my brain. But anyway, my best friend, who's now one of my best friends ever, um, and and we'll get onto that. He, mm. you either end up best friends for life or enemies for life. Mm. Anyway, best friends for life. Um, I can't remember. I don't know what we were arguing about, right? Yeah, so, he, and he's he's a big six foot three guy, uh, massive uh, massive unit. Uh, in fact, his nickname is Yeti. Okay. He's that big, right? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, we have an argument about nothing. He comes at me. He's grabbing me. I'm grabbing him. I'm not going to back down. So I'm, 
I'm looking up at him, like, yeah. <laughs> you know. And then um, I, I have a, I had this massive knife just that was given to me by this uh, military guy. He said, you know, if you ever get attacked by a polar bear, last last resort, right? Yeah. <laughs> Pull the knife. I was like, okay, that's it. I'm going for the knife. And I went, if I'm going to attack Yeti, I'm going to need the shotgun. So I'm going to stab him with the knife, and then I'm going to go for the shotgun. And then I went, you know what? This is just like the book, yeah. right? So he's arguing me. He's going. He's threatening to kill me, and I, I suddenly let go of him. I put my arms around him. I hugged him, and I said, "I love you." Wow! Doesn't matter what you say, I love you. And he's like, "Yeah, yeah." What the? <laughs> I'm, going I'm, gonna, I'm trying to kill you. Yeah. What? And it, it suddenly, it diffused the whole, whole thing. And then everything went back to, you know. And that's how they got the script for Brookback Mountain. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, wow. Yeah. That's insane. So, I mean, but, but you it's know, weird you, how you could change, right? How you can be out of yourself for, yeah. that, for that moment. So, we, when we went to the, so the last, so the, there were several teams going to the North, Magnetic North. Um, and it was ostensibly, you know, we were. It was a race, and we wanted to be see who was going to get there first and everything. But the the penultimate day, we were all about. There were three teams about fifty kilometers away from the final GPS point, and we knew that our team. We were very good at certain things, and we knew the other team were mm. very good at certain things. So we thought, look, if we wake up at eight a.m. as normal. And the other teams all wake up roughly at 8 a.m. Then it's a foot race yeah. between who gets there first, right? So we just have to, you know, run. But we were doing about 30 kilometers a day, 30 yeah. to 40 kilometers a day. And we, we knew that that day, whoever got the furthest, camped, woke up the next day and, and started, Apparently. we'd probably get there first. And we were all talk, we you know, we were sitting chatting in our tent and we, you know, we're like... I don't know how it happened, but just between the three of us, it became an automatic, like, groupthink ESP. We all mm. decided at the same time. He said, look, when it comes to... So at, at 8 a.m., 8 p.m., 8 p.m. was safety call. Mm. So we all had to call in our GPS to the um, safety base. They would log us our, our, our position where we'd camp the night. So we just said, you know what? 8 p.m., we'll do our safety call. And just carry on. But we, won't on. Camp. <laughs> we will carry on. Yeah. And we. I mean, were you guys racing or or not? Well, it was supposed to be a race, but we. What I said was because we were carrying extra equipment, we were carrying cameras, and uh, yeah. we were carrying a whole load of extra weight that yeah. we were. It wasn't. We said, you know, we'll we'll do. We're using this race as an ex, as a vehicle to get to the North Pole. Mm. So we're just going to latch on, and you know, we're, we're not going to we're not going to compete. Of course. Mm when we get into the race and we're actually doing quite well we're thinking yeah actually you know what yeah. we said we're not going to but we are yeah. uh because we're all competitive you know in, in some um in some some way but <clears throat> i also have to add um each stage of the race was timed so mm -hmm. the we got to the north pole first but when you add up all the times, we came third. Oh, okay. So, but yeah. it was still it was still a matter of pride. The yeah. fact that we said, you know what, we're not we're not going to go to sleep. We'll let the others go to sleep, but we're going to go twenty four hours. Yeah. <clears throat> Fateful decision because we ended up in two um, blizzards. Wow. So hundred kilometer winds. We couldn't see that far in front of our face. You know, we couldn't actually see. It sounds weird. Uh, you can't see what's up and down, up up or down. So as you're walking and you're trying to look. You keep tripping ah, okay, because you think your your foot is yeah, going on the ground. Just all over the place, yeah. And you, yeah. So it, I read about it before I went to the North Pole, mm. and I was like, "That's." It's that's, like that last step, you know. Sometimes when you're walking down the stairs and you think there's another one, but <laughs> there yeah, isn't. Yeah. Exactly. And you're doing you're doing uh, you're doing both. You're doing you're putting your foot down, thinking it's you've already reached the last step, and yeah. going oh yeah, and there's not. And then you're also doing the opposite, where you yeah. think uh, the the. the there the is step, one yeah. more step yeah, and there isn't and there isn't he's just walking around like a bunch of oompa loompas just, just like oh yeah so actually what what yeah. happens is as you're so we're all we're all walking in a line yeah and you can look at the guy in front of you and he's like he's drunk mm. <laughs> he's, he looks like he's drunk he's he's walking yeah, like yeah. this he's stumbling and you're like anyway 
<laughs> and that's nothing to do with uh, fatigue or or alcohol. That's just to do with the conditions, right? Yeah. Uh, so there's such low contrast between, um, like, ev- you know, even if there's a tiny ridge mm. in the snow, because you can't see it, you put your foot into that okay. and you trip. Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, anyway. So you spent half the time picking each other up off the floor. So it was it was nuts. Yeah. Um, uh, so at eight at eight p.m. came. We gave the safety call. We carried on. Uh, we ended up in two blizzards. Uh, we ended up uh, halluc- I ended up hallucinating all sorts of crazy stuff. I ended up. I ended up. There was one point we came to this flat area, came to this ridge, came over the ridge, flat area. I saw this red tent, and I was like, "Oh my god, they beat us!" Like, how did they beat us? We walked nonstop. Yeah. We the others camped. How oh, I was just crying my eyes out. I was like, oh my God, they beat us in the red tent. And my mates were like, what red tent? It's like the red tent that was there. Like, where's and it that wasn't red there. Tent? Anyway, of course, there wasn't a red tent. And none of us had red tents. We all had yeah, green yeah. tents, right? Um, later on, there was a point where we're, I'm following uh, the, the, the lead person. And I'm swearing they're, they're veering off to the, to the right. I'm following them and we're all check checking our sort of yeah. GPS and anyway I see this uh, Spitfire like this old world plane yeah, yeah old World War II plane and I go to the pilot and I say look can you just confirm north is that way or do I follow that direction he's like no no straight that way I was like oh cheers carry on and I was like guys the pilot's saying it's this way no, what <laughs> fucking pilot <laughs> anyway, anyway of course saying some of these stories sounds like i'm a complete nutcase but yeah. uh some of these stories i tell to other adventurers and mm. they're like yeah know what you mean yeah and then i tell other people like yeah you were on drugs yeah, yeah. you were drinking you you know it, 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 some of the wow. stuff just doesn't make uh no it's incredible i mean i i have a, a lot of friends that are, do similar things and a lot of them have told me that they've hallucinated on, on on certain trips and stuff you know whether it be to lack of sleep or oxygen or or right. that kind of thing. Yeah. That, I mean, you only have to stay awake for two days here in your house, and you will eventually start hallucinating. Hallucinating, yeah. You know. Um, yeah. And, and and imagine so the one one of the things I, how I explain how difficult it was to especially to kids to understand. Um, you can't understand the cold because you'll never understand minus fifty unless you've been in minus fifty. You can't. You you, you might understand walking thirty kilometers, but it's not a big deal. It's just mm. a bit longer than, a bit shorter than a marathon, right? So. Okay, mm. you walked a marathon, big deal. You were doing 50 kilos, big deal. Okay, let me just explain. Normally, you would eat, let's say, a normal male will eat 2,000 calories a day. Mm. Uh, let's just say, yeah, yeah. is that a good guess? Yeah, of course. So that's breakfast, lunch, and dinner, right? Yeah. Okay, normal day, you have breakfast, lunch, and dinner, 2,000. Normal day for us, normal day for us, we're eating 6,500 calories. Wow. Okay, so that's the equivalent of breakfast, 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 yeah. lunch, 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 dinner, dinner, dinner. Like, if you're eating three times as much as normal... Then your metabolism must be burning at a rate of... Yeah. Uh, but how do you get the time to eat all that food? Yeah, yeah. Okay, it's just like we're eating sticks of fat, of butter, you know, like to get wow. the calories, right? Um, were you actually eating... No, no, I'm, just, oh, I'm okay. just saying it's like... Well, what were you eating? What uh, what, what could you do? I'll get, I'll get to yeah. that. Uh, yeah, let me get... So, um, that last day... Of the walk to the north to, to get to the magnetic north pole i ate three days rations wow. so i ate the equivalent of twenty thousand calories in one day in 24 hours and at the end of it i show a photo of me before and after and hopefully i'll, I'll give you some yeah. of these photos you look at the photo of bef- me before i look six months pregnant i've got a I've got a C cup, yeah. uh, and then you see me in the photo afterwards. I've lost ten kilos. I am burnt to wow. sinew, bone, muscle, nothing. Wow. And that's eating six and a half a day, and on the last day eating twenty thousand, and I've lost ten kilos. Wow. That's so that's insane. how. But you you were also on a constant treadmill, <laughs> like all day, basically. Yeah. You were walking pretty much yeah. most of the day. So your body, I mean. I think that could be another reason why people don't kind of make it in those situations. They don't consider that they need a lot more calories than than they're burning. Because if you're look, you get in a calorie deficit, you're going to lose a lot of a lot of fat, and you need your fat, especially in the cold. Yeah. 
actually yeah yeah absolutely so um i think most people who do these expeditions know this they're mm. pre-prepared and a lot of them bulk up before they go mm. because you 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 put on a lot of weight and yeah. fat before you go because you know you're going to need yeah. the insulation um but you made a good very good point especially for the south pole which i've not done um that's almost a thousand kilometers and mm. the 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 calculations are i need 8,000, let's say 8,000 to 10,000 calories a day. But the more calories I carry in my in my uh, yeah. in my in my sled, the, more the gonna heavier yeah. my pulk is going to be. The heavier my pulk is going to be, the more I'm going to burn. Yeah. So you end up in this in this crazy calculation where you're trying to get the most calorie dense food yeah. with the lightest. And so you asked me mm. what type of food we eat: dehydrated food because okay. the most um, heavy part of any food and I was looking around for food because yeah. there's no food around but um, let's say an apple very high volume yeah and most of it most of that weight is water right yeah true and what are you surrounded by at the North Pole it's ice <laughs> <laughs> water water yeah. Yeah. and pure the purest water yeah. uh, you know I mean obviously you're not the I you know, you know if you if you get the the um, the snow mm. off the the ice pack that is the that is the cleanest water you can you ever get, get yeah. right so then you just uh, you 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 dig that water you get a bucket full of that water yeah. and then you you boil it you melt it you boil it and then you you pour it into these uh, you know astronaut food yeah. into the package you mix it up and, and then it. you eat this 2000 calories insane. a piece these uh, these meals right expedition yeah. meals uh, but Still not enough. Wow. Crazy, huh? I know what I need to do when I'm shredding for my next beach holiday. <laughs> I'm just going to go on a quick thing to the Atlantic. So now, look, you, you, I mean, you've been a part, a part of many world records and you you like traveling as well. So you've been to uh, 85 countries? Yeah. So um, Planning for 100. Why 100? Why is that the, the cutoff? So the, I don't know if you've ever heard of this thing called couch surfing. Yeah, of course. Mm. That, that's how Airbnb started. Right. Yeah. yeah. So um, we were doing. I was. I had a place in Bahrain. I had uh, four, uh, you know, uh, on, ensuite uh, master bedrooms and a and a and a maids room, like a, a single room. And I was living with my brother and a few other people, and and we had this spare room. And I'd heard about couch surfing. And I thought, I, I don't particularly want to travel and stay on people's yeah. couches, but let them come and stay yeah. and, and we'll meet interesting people who are doing interesting things, mm. right? And we met so many weird and interesting people who are like, who goes backpacking to Bahrain? Mm. So very strange, uh, unusual people, not strange, uh, eccentric and interesting. And so there was one guy who came, Finnish guy, and uh, he was about 28, 29 years old and he'd been to 96 countries in the world. Wow. And we're like, oh, well, yeah, well, you know, I, I, I was, I'd worked for Gulf Air, and you know, we'd, we'd worked in the airlines, and my brother worked for Etihad, and like, yeah, we've, yeah, we must have done a hundred, uh, and then we all started counting, and we're like, yeah, we're on thirty-five or something, mm. you know, we were, because we always go to the same countries, we always yeah, go yeah. back to England and back yeah, yeah. to Dubai, back to Oman. It's like, actually, I fly a lot, but it's to the same forty countries, mm. you know. I was like, okay, actually. Um, this guy gave us, and he so he was saying there's a there's a, uh, a society called the Travelers Century Club. And once you get to a hundred, you can be a part of the club. Yeah. Yeah. And so he said his father had been part of the United Nations when it first started in 1945. He'd been an official for the United Nations, and his father, and this is what he said, his father had been the first person to ever visit all 193 countries in the United Nations. Wow. Well as part of his job I was like okay well, I mean I, I may have got the details wrong because it wasn't 193 when it first started but mm. anyway whatever he'd been to a lot of countries and he was trying to get to 100 before he was 30 so well, all of us were he was 30 yeah. as well yeah, yeah so he was 28 yeah. and then you know he, he, he was coming through he was Bahrain and I think UAE Qatar and Saudi or whatever those were 96, 97, 98, yeah. 99 um, anyway, he's done a hundred, but at the time we were like, "This is actually kind of a cool idea." So this is long before North Pole or whatever, okay. you know. So after that, uh, we, you know, because you, when you work for the airline, you get 
ID nineties, so yeah. you can fly places yeah. cheaply. So we're like, let's go there this weekend. Let's go, yeah. you know, let's go to somewhere else we have not been. Let's go to. So um, yeah, I, and over the years I've been collecting countries. I mean, I'm now on eighty five. Um, it's very British of you. I've been collecting countries. <laughs> as long as it's not in the same way that the monarchy was collecting countries, then we're all right. <laughs> I, when I say collecting, I, I don't mean invading. I mean, yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. So, yeah. How, I mean, how did that stop you? How did the whole corona kind of affect that that kind of dream for you, that goal? Well, actually, the, the goal kind of got uh, disrupted long before that because, um, I, I mean, I was working for Oman Air, but um, when I stopped working for them, you, you know, you don't get the tickets, yeah, yeah. you don't get that. It's not as easy. I mean, it's expensive flying around the world, yeah. especially flying to unusual places. Yeah, yeah. You know, you have yeah. to connections and yeah. and also different places i mean i i traveled for two years uh backpacking around the world um and i literally went from one side completely to the other um you know singapore thailand fiji hawaii chile um you know argentina brazil all that stuff and i literally time traveled because i left new zealand on a monday and then i arrived in chile nope. on a sunday and i was just like <laughs> yeah time travel <laughs> check done <laughs> kind of thing but yeah but there's there's nothing like traveling like my kids i'm really going to encourage them to to literally backpack i mean if we're if the world's still the same place yeah then, um because nothing broadens the horizons and and makes makes you know like yeah, traveling, like but, being in a different country not ha but i'm i don't mean going in because this is a, actually a funny story because my friend just sold his house for a couple of million pounds so he was like let's go traveling around the world and i was like all right let's do it so he wanted to stay in all of the big hotels so we went to thailand he wanted to stay in the most expensive hotel and then i was like N mate that's not for me i don't want to be in the poshest hotel in every country that's not traveling the world so mm. we literally split after the first country I put a backpack on. I literally had no shoes on my feet. And I was going from country to country, meeting people on the road. And women were saying, oh, come stay in my house. And I'll do the gardening for them. And then they say, hey, this is my daughter. Why don't you marry her? I'm like, no, I'm all right. I'll go to another place. And, and you just meet people. And then yep. that way, there's no itinerary. So you, you'll meet people. You'll, you'll make friends. Yep. If you like them, they might be moving on to the next country. If not, you'll be like, nice to meet you. I'm off. Yep. <laughs> kind of thing. And I've done both. And, and, and the... the the, the 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 sort of the the dark not dark side but the sad side of doing this uh country collection is some of the countries i've been to like i think i drove from austria to yes. slovenia wow just to go to the we just drove into it like 20 kilometers yeah. get out and then drive back and yeah. i wasn't in the country for more than i couldn't tell you anything about slovenia i couldn't yeah, you yeah. know um but of course you go in you take the photo that you to prove that you've yeah. you've been in the country and then you so there's that side of it and then mm. of course there's the side where um uh euro 2004 i went round portugal wow. and we stayed in i can't remember what they're called like um uh pensions i think they're called where people it was a bit like airbnb but it's an organized thing okay. you, you turn up to a village you, you go to this person's house they have a spare room you're paying for the spare room and stay there you stay the there for a few days while you go to the game and then you move to the next town stay in another person's house yeah. and you meet these people random people some of them <laughs> some of them have a word of english yeah. i had no words of portugal but they don't, you don't need to yeah but yeah it's just yeah exactly. isn't, that, isn't that the beauty of it that you're just all kind of like sign languaging to each other and you, you want to yeah. eat, okay you want whole food yeah it's spicy yeah, I don't love this one <laughs> you know i think that's the beauty of it exactly and that's how you learn languages too and, and so and so some of them like um gosh i can't remember i can't think of a good one but like when i hitchhiked from from england to paris made wonderful friends yeah. on this crazy trip right um and then of course I've stayed in, I've flown to Paris and stayed in hotels. Yeah. Didn't really get much of an experience, right? Yeah. So, it, you know, they're, they're I mean, look, there's a time of, and a place. If you're going around, you've got your wife and kids, you know. Yeah, okay. Yeah, then yeah, you're going to go yeah, stay yeah, in a nice yeah, hotel yeah, yeah, and you're going to experience yeah. those things. You're going to go down the Champs Elysees and all this stuff. Yeah. But if you're just with a mate or, or whatever, it's like, I want to almost die on this trip. <laughs> like, I want to get into a car that pretended he was a cab, that we realized halfway through that he wasn't a cab. 
and then opened the doors and rolled out because that happened to us <laughs> we almost got kidnapped on one of our journeys you know we realized we we're like hold on a minute this guy's not taking us anywhere near where we're going we literally drop and rolled out the car he was he realized okay they've clocked carried on driving <laughs> and then we just were like that was fun as shit that was like we almost got taken to a ukrainian slaughterhouse like we were almost part of a movie and i think those kind of things they're they're, they're really cool experiences man uh, yeah they're, they're really if you cool. make it <laughs> that's, 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 <laughs> they're really it cool stories if yeah. you live <laughs> if you're an, if, you, if your story is in a netflix thriller then no it's not a good thing but oh, i mean God. i think i think that's what life is that the kind of real yeah so especially I, younger uh, when you're younger yeah um yeah i think i'm so, so I, in fact I, I did a speech about this once which was mitigating uh what was it called it was mitigating risk when trying to commit suicide mm, wow <laughs> so <laughs> that's an interesting topic you chose <laughs> so people think that all these expeditions i do like you know how many people die on these expeditions yeah. right so mitigating risk when you're trying to commit suicide well obviously i'm not trying to commit yeah, yeah. suicide but um so for example when you're parachuting yeah you have a you have safety procedures you're trained yeah. how to use the parachute you're how trained to what to do parachute. blah blah yeah. blah 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 and then it, it, in the event of a cutaway or anything like that yeah exactly yeah. so you know what to do you know yeah. so there's there's all of that so when you first time i went parachuting i was like obviously i was nervous this is single parachuting or or um tandem. oh no 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 <laughs> tandem. i've not done tandem i've only done single yeah so par paratroopers or yeah okay, so when, nice. when i the first time i did it of course i was nervous like yeah. anyone would be but by the third time uh have you ever seen that movie it's an old movie called june no and they've remade it uh, i think it's coming out again soon but th there's one part in it where um the benny nesserine which is this kind of like witch woman she says to this uh to prince uh I forget his name prince aratrades He's told to put his hand inside a box and he says what's in the box and she says pain okay and then she puts something to his neck and says if you move your hand out i will jab you and you'll instantly die and he's and he's like i, I can't remember exact the exact words but anyway basically he's supposed to put his hand in and whatever he feels inside when he puts his hands inside the box is only um it's not real it's okay. just imaginary right so the whole time kind of like my bank <laughs> <laughs> your bank account yeah my bank account, same kind of thing yeah <laughs> and the thing that stuck with me was um fear he keeps saying to himself this mantra uh fear is the mind killer fear is the mind killer so your fear mm. will the fear of what's happening to his hand will make him withdraw but it, okay. fear is irrational and fear will make you do things that you shouldn't do right mm. So I ended up uh, a few years ago. I ended up um, in South Africa going cage shark diving wow. in Durban. Yeah. So they put you inside a metal cage. They drop you in the water, and then uh, and then they say to you, you know, if you want to get out the sh yeah, yeah. cage and swim with the sharks, yeah, and everyone's yeah. like, no way. And yeah. I was like, why not? Hold on. The the guys or whatever they are, the, these guys are in wetsuits, and you know they have um, um, scuba diving gear. And they're swimming with the sharks. There's other people who are swimming with the sharks. Mm. And they've told us, these great whites, they will not eat humans. Your b blood is too iron rich, blah, 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 blah. They've explained everything. Okay? Yeah. Well, if they can do it, I can do it. Yeah. I'm totally the same as you. I I'm, get out. Yeah, I no get one's going to make me do something if they didn't know it was okay. Yeah. So like I, those shows, yeah. So there's these two yeah. things. If they can do it, I can do it. That's one. And when I'm getting out, the one thing they said is, don't thrash. You start thrashing, yeah. they'll come and investigate, right? So fear is the mind killer. So I get out the cage <laughs> and I start swimming with these sharks. Of course, I last about 10, 15 seconds before yeah. I'm like, this shark came to, and I've got photos of it. This yeah. car, shark comes swimming towards me, not but not attacking. It's just... Yeah because i didn't think that i was like i am getting out and back into this yeah, but what you didn't realize was he was coming to you going i swear that's the first arab guy to go <laughs> to the magnetic <laughs> yeah. the bin. Yeah. is that you yeah. So, yeah. yeah so i did that a few times and each yeah. time i got out and i was like fear is the mind killer don't panic mm. fear will make you panic panic will make you get eaten i get out swim mm. with the sharks for a bit get back in i was the only one that got in and out mm. Uh, or got in but like I was the only one did that but it, it was that whole set mindset from June 
Yeah. Fear is the mind killer. And the same thing happens, you know, when, um, like with parachuting, you panic on, on something like that and that could be the what kills you, not... Yeah, not the actual activity itself. Exactly, yeah. But that's the thing that is even like, the, I don't understand people, maybe because I've always had this thirst for adrenaline in life since I was young. When I see people on these game shows and stuff and they have to do something like that, they have to... I don't know, run away from a dog chasing them or or go and feed a lion, drop something next to a lion. I was like these shows are insured and they're and they're you know, they're not gonna put you in a position yeah. that you're gonna die. It's just not gonna happen. Yeah. So why did, does none of them look like they're enjoying themselves? <laughs> there was a show called Endurance, a Japanese game show yeah. in the in, and every week I don't know if you remember it, every week uh, I forget the guy's name, he would show a clip from this and it was what they would make these Japanese yeah. guys do, right? One of the when he got to the final, you know, one of the final things what they did was uh, they strapped the um, the contestants to wooden boards, mm. poured gasoline over them. Okay, it's fucking Japan, man. It's <laughs> fucking crazy, bro. <laughs> and then, and then uh, I can't remember. They put lighted something near them, and it was the you know whoever whoever gets off whoever first. panicked first, yeah. right? And of course, what they, you know, what they, what they did was it was water or <laughs> something that they put on them. Yeah. Of course, they demonstrated with gasoline. This is what's going to happen. We're going to pour this. This is the match. When it burns, when it or the candle or whatever, mm. when it eventually gets to you, it's going to set you on fire, right? So that's the thing. Okay, strap yourselves down. They're panicking so much mm. they don't realize they're being doused in water, yeah. not gasoline. And their mind would trick them into thinking they're smelling <laughs> gasoline. <laughs> that's very so, cool. It's exactly as you yeah. said. I was thinking the whole time I'm watching these, I'll be like. Um, yeah, this is a game show. Yeah, There's you know, never going to really, be any yeah. real danger, yeah. right? No, I, I guess they danger. can smell the gasoline from the previous thing that they did. Yeah, and but, they think it's that. Yeah, 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 yeah but then uh, uh, even the one where they uh, an another silly one was where they had uh, bull fighting, and mm. they had bulls. They they opened the gate, and the bull comes out, and they had a and this is the demonstration. They had the bullfighter with the the cape, and yeah. and then the bull would run into some, you know, see. Yeah. And if you get caught, you die, yeah. right? So of course, what they do is. They strap them to like a crucifix, okay, and they're facing away from the bull. <laughs> and when they say when they sh fire the gun, they have to run, yeah, yeah. right? There's no bull. It's yeah, a, yeah, it's a yeah, mechanical yeah. bull. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> mate, I think we need to bring these shows back, mate, and uh, and start it all again. Bull run Dubai on Sheikh Zayed. <laughs> so there's so, no real danger, right? How did you get shot in the chest? <laughs> yeah, okay. Straight into Sto that one. Stories after stories. This guy, I'm telling you, he's a, he's a book. Um. Okay, this is actually the funny part of this is actually the longer part. There's a funny part of you getting <laughs> shot in the chest. <laughs> so, um, it was back when I was in the army, I had a sergeant, really great guy, mm. uh, called we called him Harry Belfon after the jazz musician, mm -hmm. right? Um, so Staff Sergeant Belfon was a bit of a ladies' man. He had, uh, I think, he had four wives, not four wives at the same time, but he wasn't he wasn't Muslim, but he yeah. had four wives, and he was on his fourth wife. He had nine kids. Wow, uh, and he, I'm the godfather to his his last kid, and um, but he came to me. We were just chatting about. It. He said, oh, "I'm thinking about getting a motorbike," and I said, "That is the dumbest idea ever." Uh, and I'll tell you why. First, you've got nine kids. How are you going to stick nine yeah. kids on the motorbike? That's one. That's just practical. Well, if he was Thai or Indian, they would find, <laughs> they would a, way, find a way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, the second thing is. Um, risk mitigation mm. if you're on a bike and you get hit you know if you're in a car accident it doesn't matter whose fault it is mm. the guy on the bike is the one likely to you know die. <laughs> yeah. to die and i and I actually seen something happen re, um not too f far in the past i'd seen a, a motorbike going along the road he had right of way a car came out of the t-junction came out too far yeah totally the driver's fault the motorbike hit the engine the engine block of this um mm. the car was a write-off it was a tiny little mini or whatever mm. and this was a big 750 cc motorbike so the motorbike was fine yeah but he <laughs> but the, the motorbike driver died and the car driver was fine wow and i was just like you can't get a motorbike yeah. blah 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 risk and da, da 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 and he was like yeah but you know mr nabs um i could die and we were on the way to the shooting range Okay, <laughs> here's where the so, story gets funny. <laughs> and we were on the way to the shooting range. And he goes, you know, uh, you could get shot at the shooting range, right? And I said, yeah, but the, see, the difference is 
we have procedures. The fire is always aimed down the range. The you know the range officer and the yeah. the instructors are all standing behind the shooters. The guys that are doing the marking are in butts, so yeah. they're underground. Yeah. So the risk is minimal. What you're talking about is standing in front of the guys with the gun. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you know there's a big difference between you know saying or oh, you know you could get hit by a bus. Yeah, anyone could get hit by a bus, but if you don't look both ways, yeah. it's more likely to happen, right? So, look, you asked my opinion. I think it's a bad idea. You've got too many kids and the risk is too high, yeah. you know, especially when so many people rely on you. Anyway, we left it at that. So we're doing our, we're on the shooting range and <clears throat> we're with these old SA-80. So the old SA-80 had a bad reputation for stoppages. Mm. So you're firing away, bang, 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 click. click. Yeah. Now, obviously when you're in the army, the, you know, they drill into you, your normal... Yeah. SOPs so mm. safety catch on da, 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 blah, 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 blah. carry yeah. on firing bang 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 click so this guy this poor guy was getting stoppages constantly on his rifle so the first time he got a stoppage the so what normally happens is every two shooters there's a, uh, a, a barrier in between them there's a, no there's a guy who stands there watching both of them okay. and he's coaching making sure they don't do anything so the bombardier is looking at them and he's just saying don't panic normal safety procedures normal stoppage drills blah 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 does it blah 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 he gets another stoppage and it's normal don't panic it's just normal stoppage drills carry on third time it happens i said to the sergeant better go and just keep an eye on that one particular guy because yeah he's 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 gonna get flustered yeah, yeah, he's yeah. gonna get flustered right so <clears throat> third time it happens he's he's going i don't blah, blah. He's, he's sort of getting angry with his uh and then um he, he sort of, um, I, I think it was third or fourth time, he gets up and uh, they say, all right, come off, the sh come off the firing range and we'll, you know, we'll sort out the gun, we'll give you a different gun, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, he's turned round with his rifle and he's no, going, this, this ah. thing isn't bloody working, right? And of course, as he's shaking it, trying to get this thing to work, the triggers. he has an ND, a negligent discharge. Mm -hmm. And at this point, I'm walking towards him saying, you know, don't, don't panic. Keep calm. Keep the rifle pointed. Keep the rifle pointing down the range. Keep... Suddenly, this bullet goes off, and everything happened in slow motion because he it was actually pointing it down at the ground as I'm mm. walking towards him. So I can hear it go off, and I can see the I can't see the bullet, but I can I can see that it, the bullet this went off charger. into the ground, and it ricochets and bounces up, and it's tumbling. And it hits me in the chest. Now, of course, of course, this happens in like split second. Okay, yeah. I, mean, I obviously didn't see it, but yeah. I could see. And this was before Neo, so you didn't know to do the whole, you know, <laughs> before the because you would have. That's obviously what you would have done in that situation if we had already seen it. Yeah. So I get hit, you know, boom! I get hit in the chest. I'm thrown backwards, and you know, even before I'm even before I hit the ground, I'm I'm pulling my uh, my combat jacket open. I'm, uh, you know, I'm thinking. Got to get uh, access to the wound and blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking this all in my head as I'm going, you know, obviously, you know, yeah. in my head. Time this changes, was, yeah, yeah. Yeah, time changes. So obviously yeah. I didn't see the bullet and blah, blah, yeah. blah. But what happened was I got hit by the spent ricochet. It hit me in the chest so hard that it knocked me over. As I'm lying there going, medic, medic, medic. But there's no point of entry or anything. No point of entry because what's happened is it's it's hit me with it has lost so much kinetic energy all it's yeah. done is and it's flat all it's done is hit me and bruised me and knocked me over right wow. so as i'm lying on the ground going oh my god oh my god like <laughs> um harry belfon comes over me and goes there's no eggs there's no entry wound you, you know there's no entry wound blah, blah, blah. and and then i look at him and went and he's just looking at me smiling and i just okay get, get your the motorbike. fucking bike <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right get the motorbike get the motorbike <laughs> <laughs> Bloody hell, was, you can't write that stuff, man. Oh, yeah, yeah that was just a... Yeah. Another yeah, thing. A funny story, I guess. It, it, yeah, it's a funny story when you live. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They always are when, when you when you make it up. When, whenever you can tell the story, it's a funny story. Yeah, because... I mean, it, it doesn't bother me now, but at the time, you know, you end up with shakes. You're like, yeah. that bullet could... It, I mean, it, it could have ricocheted anywhere. It could have hit yeah. me in the face. It could have hit me in the eye. Could have killed me. Could have, you know, if it hadn't lost enough got kinetic PTSD, energy. To be honest, you know, from it, if 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 it was a, 
you know, if you were a, of, of a weaker heart, you could have just been like, well, I'm not going shooting ranges anymore. I'm not, you know, if it, yeah, yeah, it could I have guess. kind of put you off completely and, and you could have just been like very edgy, very, yeah. that's crazy. Actually, the only time I've ever had uh, like shake shakes, like real, like, I mean, so uh, I've had the shakes uh, when I was learning how to fly gliders. Yeah. I had a crash landing and after it, I was, you know, my heartbeat was 120 thready and my hands, I couldn't stop shaking. But the most, the most scared I've ever been in my life. Sharks being shot, parachute, had a parachute that didn't uh, deploy completely, blah, 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 crash landing the glider. Um, the most scared I've ever been in my life was driving in Doha. Really? <laughs> That's crazy. Why? It's like driving in Egypt. It's almost impossible. <laughs> like this was about ten years ago, and it, 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 like I don't know, they call them like the Inshallah traffic lights. Like oh, yeah, okay, Inshallah. Yeah. They yeah, might work. Like, they might change. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I driving along when it was green, and a car came, 120, in the red, wow. just missed me, and I went, I was like, God. And then I, I sort of parked up, and uh, for a second, I was like, God. And then I was driving along, and not five minutes later, same thing happened to me. Mm. I had to pull over, and I had to call someone because my hands were shaking. Really? I was, I was, I, I mean, it was, it was so close two times. So that happened straight after. Yeah. Yeah, that was a setup, mate. <laughs> <laughs> someone's, someone's sorry to, to tell me. you, but yeah, that was a failed attempt. To that was. <laughs> yeah. Bloody hell. What is a banana marathon? <laughs> See, to the, Ooh, have we got time? <laughs> we got about ten minutes. <laughs> um, so th this was before I'd done all my expeditions, right? Uh, I'd never done a marathon, and I always thought, yeah, it'd be cool to do a marathon, right? Yeah. I mean, so many people than do them now, mm. but at the time I've I was done them. Fifteen, not cool at yeah. all. <laughs> yeah. Fifteen years ago, I think it was. I was thinking, yeah, it'd be, I'd, you know, I'd like to do a marathon, and at the time. Uh, there was a friend of mine. He was doing uh, a marathon every two weeks. Okay. So he did over two years. He did fifty-two marathons, right? Raising money for charity. So um, he and, and in fact, we never even talked about John O'Groats. We never talked about yeah, this we'll, wheelchair we'll, attempt we'll, we'll, we'll and stuff like that. Anyway, so then, yeah. this guy he was doing all these marathons and, and um, he said, "Listen, I got extra spots in the Washington D.C. marathon." So normally when you do okay. a marathon, in a big marathon, so we're talking about London, New York, mm -hmm. it's Boston, it's very difficult to get a, a place, a ticket. And what they'll do a lot of the times is they'll, they'll sell their, a spot to a charity. Oh, okay, and the charity will. And the charity will say, you know, you can have this number if you raise $5,000 or whatever, you know, whatever the, the, the number is. <clears throat> so that's how charities make a lot of money off mm -hmm. marathons. Um, so uh, my friend Rick said basically, he, well, look, you, you know, you need, Here's a here's a, a slot in the marathon, and I was like, I want to do a marathon. I'd love to do a marathon. Mm. Uh, and he goes, Okay, well here's the number. It's five thousand dollars. I was like, Oh, wait, you want me to pay? To pay? Oh well. Oh, I gotta yeah. get. I gotta give you five thousand dollars. As if like it wasn't appealing enough that you want me to run a marathon. <laughs> so I ha I have yeah. to run a marathon and I have to pay for the pleasure. Yeah. Or the pain of it. Yeah. And I was like, uh. and then so and then I was thinking, you know what? I've wanted to do a marathon for a while. I've got this opportunity. There are going to be 33,000 people running this marathon. And every single one of them, apart from the elite runners who get given their, yeah. uh, you know, you, you if you've done it under two minutes, two hours, 30, here's a, you know, yeah. we want you. Yeah. Everyone else, money. Uh, 33,000, 30, 30,000 30, people are all raising $5,000. Yeah. If they can do it, there's no reason why I can't do it. And I've just got to figure out a way of doing it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So any anything else is just an excuse on my part. Mm. So is this $5,000 a good reason not to do it? Or is it just, am I just mm. making a sh crappy excuse, right? I was like, okay, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to figure a way of doing this. Now, I, I mean, we didn't talk about this, but... I don't drink alcohol. Yeah. Same. So, but you know, in England, every time you go to the pub, uh, do you want to drink? You know, yeah. rounds, and I was like, like, no, sorry, I don't drink. And, you know, do you want a coke? No, nah, not really. 
I can only have like one Coke a night, you know, yeah. 10 Cokes is, uh, you know. We've, so, seen you, we've seen you on Red Bull tonight, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, one Red Bull a night. So, um, I, I, so I said, you know what? For whatever, 20 years in England, I've mm-hmm. been going to pubs and not one of my friends ever bought me a drink. Right? So <laughs> I wrote, time to collect, motherfuckers. So, <laughs> so I wrote to everyone in my email list yeah. and said, hey, guys, you know how you've never bought me a drink ever? This, uh, yeah. This is the time. I want everyone to donate five dollars for every, you know, as, for as every year <laughs> that you haven't. Yeah. Uh, I want everyone to do, you know, five dollars. It's the same as a coffee or a pint. Okay. Yeah. None of you bought me a pint, so this yeah. is what you're gonna do. And just to sweeten the deal, whoever donates the highest amount gets to dictate what fancy dress ah oh, amazing yeah but you can't i had i put in a lot of rules yeah, i'm not doing thongs i'm not doing no 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 i said but yeah. but because i knew that you know you, you yeah. know what it's like in english yeah, yeah you say something stupid like that and immediately yeah. they take you got to bore it out they, they take, they take the piss yeah. out of it right yeah. so the first thing i said was you know no repetitions of fancy dress mm. because the first as soon as i sent this email out te- i got a bid of ten dollars naked yeah 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 that's great because I knew that I would get a fifteen dollar bed yeah. bid, and it could, it wouldn't be naked, yeah, right? Yeah. So, anyway, of course, naked women's lingerie, high heels, deep sea diver, you know, yeah. with the big. Yeah, yeah. I got all these things, right? Do 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 do. Anyway, within two days, I'd raise five thousand dollars, all from donations of five dollars or more, and I got to the point where the last bid, which just took me over five thousand was to run it as a banana <laughs> in a blonde wig. And I was like, you know what? Considering yeah. all the options, yeah. one was to run it with a parachute. Like, oh my goodness. <laughs> Why do people always do that as well? When they, they, I'm like, did you forget? I'm doing a marathon. I already, running this in full marathon workout think, gear is hard enough. Do you think they didn't know? Yeah, yeah. They knew. They always do that stuff, man. <laughs> So banana was like the least of my worries. Yeah, yeah. Right? I was like, okay, banana. I'm going to do it as a banana, right? So um, I've got the money. I've got the slot. And then suddenly mm. I find out, oh, you know what? It was two days after Ramadan ended. This marathon. And I thought, mm. oh, you know what? I'm going to fly to DC. It's Ramadan. I'm fasting. The yeah. whole month I won't be able to train. Yeah. And I thought, you know what? I, I don't want to do this marathon because I want to do my best. Yeah. I want to do well in this marathon. So I want to train. I want to be yeah, fit. I want to. There's a banana in a blonde wig, mate. It doesn't matter how well you do. Exactly. So at this yeah. point, I'm like, you know, uh, actually, is this actually a good excuse? Or is, am I just making an excuse? Because I'm not going to set any world records yeah. in a banana suit, <laughs> right? So yeah. what, you know, so I, I'm thinking about it. I was like, you know what? The only purpose of doing this is to finish. Mm. It's not to come first. Yeah, yeah. It's not to get a world it's record. To make it. It's not a personal best. It's just to finish. Yeah. So I'm in the banana suit and, uh, you know, I'm thinking, yeah, you know what? Ramadan, actually, I'm just trying to find yeah. excuses to delay yeah. and do it another time. But actually, I could just do it now. So I said, okay, I'm thinking of excuses. It's not a good reason. I'm going to do it. So then I get to DC to do the marathon. Everything's going fine. Uh, but then about, I guess about five, six kilometers into it, um, my shoulders are bleeding. From the suit? From the banana suit. The banana suit's not meant for marathons, <laughs> yeah. right? So, uh, of course, this constant, this plastic banana yeah, is yeah. rubbing into my shoulder. Yeah. <laughs> And it's basically soaring into my wow. shoulders, right? Um, so you know, this is the this is the point where I realised why sports bras have very thick straps. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Should have wore a sports bra, mate. <laughs> so anyway, I had to go to an aid station, and I was I was talking to the uh, to an aid station. They so <laughs> aid. It's, it's, it's a medical. He's like a banana suit gave me AIDS <laughs> on my shoulder. <laughs> like yeah, medical aid. So did they like kind of patch you up and? Well, I went to the medical aid station it, yeah. and it was a Marine Corps marathon. Okay. So they had Marine medics all along this sort of uh, part, uh, yeah. this route. 
I went to the medics and they were saying, oh, yeah, you should stop. And I was like, no, I'm not going to stop. Mm. You know, you need to patch me up. They're like, oh, you know, we we can put some Vaseline on you. I was like, God, you know, just give me some field That's dressings. the last thing you want to be, a banana <laughs> covered in Vaseline, bro. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm putting, um, what I did was I was wearing a T-shirt, cut the T-shirt up, yeah. wrapped it just around my pads. shoulders as pads, right? Yeah. So like... You know, I'm so far into this race. Yeah, yeah. I'm not giving up because of my shoulders are bleeding. I wanted field dressings from these guys, you know, mm. to put on my... But they, you know, so I used my T-shirt. I was like, fine, okay, I'm not giving up. Yeah. There's no way I've got all this way, yeah. Ramadan and the money, and yeah. I'm not giving this... I'm not giving up, right? Yeah. And I've raised all this money for charities. I'm running along. I'm thinking, you know, that was that is a lame excuse for me to quit. My shoulders mm. are bleeding. I got to figure out a solution, figured it out, carried on running. But about halfway through, my knee, my knee starts hurting. And I don't know what's wrong with my knee. It's heart's hurting so much that I can't actually run. Uh So I'm starting to jog and it's getting so painful. I can only, and I'm like, there's so much pain in my knee. I can't run. But again, it's back to that. It's, I'm not trying to go for world record. Yeah, yeah. All I'm trying to do is finish. I'm just trying to beat that other fucking banana that I saw over there. <laughs> <laughs> That's my only competition. The first banana. Yeah, the banana yeah, first Arab banana to make it across the line. Yeah. So I'm thinking, uh, as long as I don't give up, <coughs> as long as I complete mm. it, who cares? It's the same time. mentality with all of your previous things, right? Yeah. And and again, it's this, this thing about, is this a good reason or is it an excuse mm. to quit? Am I looking for... And this is what a lot of things are. Are you... And your threshold depends on what type of human you are or what type yeah, yeah. of motivation you have. But at the end of the day, everyone's looking for... Because re- it's too painful, it's too hard, it's too difficult. Yeah, yeah. Everyone's looking for a reason to give up, stop, quit. Mm. And in your mind, when you're doing something crazy or difficult, or whatever, you're thinking the whole time. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm not, I'm not, I can't be bothered. Yeah. Right? And so at this point, I'm thinking, my knee hurts. Am I, is this a good reason or is mm. it, uh, is it just an, another excuse? Yeah. Anyway, it's getting so painful by mile. I'm like, I'm not giving up. 20, mile 25. I am not giving up. I'm walking yeah. and I'm in so much pain. I'm in so much pain that I'm blacking out. Yeah. So the, my vision starts to tunnel. Yeah, as yeah. I put pressure on my bad knee, I'm starting to black out. And as I take the pressure yeah, off, yeah. I'm, I'm beginning to see again. Yeah. Anyway. Mile 25, I wake up, I'm on the floor. And I blacked out from the pain. So I'm like, okay, this is a pretty good reason to quit, right? I am in so much pain, I'm fainting from pain. That's a good reason to quit, Mm. right? For a normal human being. (laughs) (laughs) Or is it, right? Or is there a way, like, my left knee hurts, but my right knee is fine. Yeah. So... Am I just going to quit because I think it's difficult or am I going to carry on? Mm. I'm going to hop. I'm going to hop on my right knee mm. and I'm going to get to the end because I'm only a mile away. There's yeah, no yeah. way to I'm going to quit yeah, yeah. at this stage. And I've already limped half of the marathon. No way I'm quitting. So I said, right, f- fuck it. I'm going to hop. I'm yeah. going to hop. It doesn't matter how long it takes me. I'm going to get to the end of this marathon. I'm going to finish this marathon on my one good knee. Wow. And so I get to the end. And the, 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 the Marine Corps Marathon, there's a, a, an S bend at the end. So that you're, you're um, hopping along. And by the time I get to the um, uh, this S bend, the, that's where the all the families and friends yeah. are. And then the finish line. So I come around the corner and the people here, they're like, there's a <laughs> banana <laughs> hopping, right? Wrapped in Vaseline. <laughs> yeah. And this is about six hours into the race. So yeah. nearly everyone's already finished. Yeah. Everyone's already had water. That must have been a great visual, just this banana just coming at the end by the, itself. So there's yeah. about, I don't know, there's about 5,000 people at the finish line, yeah, yeah. all sort of with their families. And like, there's a banana. Yeah, yeah. And everyone's looking. Everyone's going, banana boy, yeah. go banana boy. <laughs> hey, he hopped the whole marathon, yeah. right? And I come around hopping this marathon yeah. and I get to the end. I get like a massive standing ovation yeah. at, this, uh, at, the, at the end. And of course, I guess one of the reasons why I like to tell that story is because I use it to illustrate the fact that, you know, at, at every point, at every uh, decision point I had, it was, this is, uh, I'm coming up with mental excuses to, you know, give mm. up or stop or get quit or whatever. And at the end, 
I still managed to do it, even though one knee is in so much pain that I'm blacking out. And now, every human, or every person doing anything difficult will get to a point where mm. they say, you know what? Mm. I'm quitting. You know, I, I'm not going to do it because of Ramadan. Mm. And that's a good enough excuse. Man, a lot of people are saying uh, they quit doing Ramadan. <laughs> not even just because it's Ramadan. They quit not even In fasting the, the whole day. Yeah. You know? Exactly. Okay. So but everyone, yeah. everyone has a different... Yeah. Uh, There's an old saying Your tolerance? mind will quit Way before your body ever does So yeah. You can You can You're right y You're right You can convince yourself Yeah I'm done But your body w Can still go for another hour Yeah Yeah yeah, yeah Absolutely yeah. Yeah, I was thinking about it But I actually have heard that before And I've actually heard I think it's the 40% rule uh, When you When you're ready to quit You've, you've still only got You've still got another. Yeah. I think it's either you've you've done only forty percent, or you've got another yeah. forty percent to go. Anyway, yeah. you're right. Absolutely, your mind will, and and that's part of the uh, part of this whole thing uh, that I try and tell kids, especially when I go to sp speak to the school. Whenever you're, let's say, you know, even let's say getting to work late. Mm. Were you late? Why were you late? You're just mm. coming up with excuses. Oh, the alarm didn't go off. This yeah. and that and the other. Actually, it's because you weren't really motivated or you weren't yeah. you know you're coming up with excuses so are these excuses yeah. or are they reasons and everything that you do whether it's going to the north pole or whether it's getting to work on time yeah doing your homework yeah. are, are these excuses because yeah. for every every at every decision point mm. i i ask you know i ask the audience should i quit and hands up and you'll see half say yes half say and then by by the end, when I've blacked out and I say, do you think I'm going to quit? And everyone goes, no. Yeah, exactly. who, who would quit? And everyone's like, no. yeah. who, do you think I quit? And everyone's got that. Dude, I guess that's a... Because I've always had this funny thing where I believe that there's a part of God in your conscience. Mm -hmm. Bear with me now. Now, you can lie to whoever you want about whatever you want. Mm. But that part of your conscience that knows you 100% lives through every single movement and thing that you do why haven't i got this job you could you could say your first if you're talking out loud oh because you know i don't think that person likes me or my they didn't see my cv or whatever immediately your conscience is going to go yeah mate because that was a slap dash cv you didn't even put any time into it or whatever or you say oh i didn't do this because of this and then you can hear your conscience laughing you're such a liar that is not this you know that is not what happened do you know what I mean? So I feel like there's an unbiased, you know, when I was younger, I said um, to one of my teachers, um, they were like, think of, you know, profound um, phrases. And I said, only when we can judge ourselves without bias will we find divine spiritual sanctuary. And that's like only when you can truly tell mm. the truth to yeah. yourself yeah. and act on that. Will you ever be in a, in a position of, of, you know, So there's this thing called like, radical accountability mm. and it's, it's very similar right mm. because every every excuse that you mentally come up with you go yeah you're, you're just making excuses or you know yeah. it, to put it in my terms is that you know is that a reason or is that an excuse yeah. you're just making excuses again and you have to the truth is when you when you're doing an expedition like uh some of the expeditions i've done you need radical accountability because you make an excuse for something you die mm right yeah, you're so fucked. you're already that far in it's like you can't make an excuse did that. you d i mean it goes yeah. down to like even before um uh did you check the batteries did mm. you check your shoelaces did you do like mate like okay you think it's a tiny thing now but uh for example when the, when it uh you know in aviation in disasters when they're talking about you know checklists and the, they say that there's 20 there's, there's never a big cause for a, a disaster but there's 22 minor ones and each one on its own um isn't sufficient to cause a disaster so you're like hey, i'm only going five five meet five yeah. miles an hour above the speed limit uh you know it's only a short distance i'm not going to wear my seatbelt. Yeah. you know and there's all these tiny tiny things like okay so it's only a short distance normally yeah. that you get away with it normally you get away with five miles an hour normally yeah. you get, but you do 22 of those minor mistakes yeah boom yeah disaster mm. right and so one of the things on uh, on the you know you have all these checklists for pilots they have multiple checklists because they're trying to make sure that you know there's yeah. an a, a, an air crash but with us you don't have formal you know yeah. uh checklists but you want to have it like 
the number of times um <laughs> so <laughs> the number of times you check everything just to make sure you've mm. not forgotten everything but the, the one that we always did was <laughs> before we went off we, we had this uh um we had some training on uh frostbite mm. cold injuries right and they showed a <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things in it, they show you injuries and the difference between frostbite, frostnip, fr you know, frostburn. And then one, one of them was like, so this guy, he's gone for a pee. He's unzipped himself. He's, he's gone for a pee. Because he's so cold, he's numb. He forgets that he's not zipped up. <laughs> Next thing you know, they show the photograph of the thing and they've had to, they have to chop it off. <laughs> they've had to chop off everything. <laughs> So you, uh, you wouldn't believe yeah, the yeah. number of good times yeah. every single guy on that trip checked. Yeah, yeah to make like, sure. I'm numb, but I'm yeah, yeah. numb zipped. Yeah, better to be numb than none, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Man, dude, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on um, the show. And I believe that I think we need three more parts <laughs> to, to yeah. finish this off. Um, yeah, dude, this is uh, truly inspirational and and I think a, a, a lot of people need to kind of have this kind of mentality of really self-analyzing and evaluating their decisions in life before quitting. Yeah, but I mean, mm. I, I say this, but then, you know, in life, a lot of the time you compromise mm. just to you go along to get along. Um, but, uh, you know, if you ever want to achieve something crazy difficult. Tell them. I want them to have their their final words of wisdom because that's that's your direct <laughs> camera to them what parting words could you well could the parting words them? from this particular podcast yeah. or whatever yeah yeah, yeah vlog the particular the, this particular one my my parting words are this next time you're doing something that's tough difficult something that you want to give up on you want to quit you want to stop doing just ask yourself Am I quitting? The reason I'm quitting, is it an excuse? Am I making excuses to quit? Or is it actually a good reason to stop? And only you can answer that. And only you have that threshold of where it's a good reason or actually it's just you making another excuse. So the, the bottom line is, are you making excuses or is this a good reason? make that decision dude it's been an absolute pleasure to have you and guys i'm thinking now while ending this podcast is it an excuse <laughs> <laughs> am i quitting <laughs> or has it come time to end this episode of this series because i believe that we're um because you have so many more sides of you that i still want to cover um in in future episodes so we would love to have you back on dude inshallah um for sure no don't say inshallah i was raised on that it means never <laughs> I had an Arab <laughs> mum who told me inshallah all the time. It means it's never gonna happen, dude. Say, say, say God, God willing. When I have, when I hear the English one, inshallah. there's more accountability to it, you know. No, no, yeah. Um, I actually again, got in trouble once because I, I asked my dad, you know, I was in the car and I said, yeah. oh, you know, can we go to, can we go to the zoo tomorrow? And he went inshallah, and I went, no. Oh. Yeah, he yeah, went, yeah. why did you say that? And I went, inshallah. I did because I was a kid. I said inshallah means no in Arabic, bro. <laughs> I grew up on that. Honestly, I did. Um, so when I say inshallah. Hmm. I mean, the proper, I mean, inshallah, if God wills, I will come. There, there yeah. you go, guys. We will see episode two. Inshallah. Thank you so much, yeah. inshallah, <laughs> um, for uh, uh, watching. Um, like and subscribe, and we'll see you later. Boom.